For those of you who haven't seen my earlier films, there's two reasons why there's this strange bloke in a cap in the middle of nowhere talking about studio affairs and technology and media composition. The first is that if I don't get out and about, then I get very unhealthy. And if I was spending time in the studio doing these vlogs, then I wouldn't be getting out and about. The other thing is, you know, as an earlier film suggests, I do think uh, recording studios are the worst place to come up with creative ideas. So I'm hoping by appearing next to these uh, fabulous Caledonian vistas, I'm being eaten alive by midges, that I'm going to encourage uh, you guys to come up with that next masterpiece. Uh, you guys in Los Angeles have no excuse. You have not only the most amazing countryside around that um, odd city, but also you don't have these midges and this sheep shit. Um, anyway, yesterday I was in London. I married my wife in the month of June. Nicotine, nicotine, now, now, now. And I courted her home by the light of the moon. Nicotine, nicotine, hey, dumb dapper, tea, willa, tea, walla, tea, rustical, twalla, tea, nicotine, nicotine, now, now, now. The saddle and bridle lay up on the shelf. Nicotine, nicotine, now, now, now. If you want any more, you can sing it yourself. Nicotine, nicotine, hey, dumb dapper, tea, willa, tea, walla, tea, rustical, twalla, tea, nicotine, nicotine, now, now, now. So I want to pick up from my last film where I spoke about agents because I think this is a very important issue and I think that we are in a time of change with the caveat that I am obviously here in this Caledonian paradise uh, a long, long way away from California and New York. So this is my experience and my assumptions of a 45-year-old media composer who's based in London and in Scotland. Maybe very different for, for, for the rest of you. A lot of people ask me about agents as a kind of, in order to be this, I need to have an agent. And I don't think that's necessarily correct these days. I don't think the agents are the gatekeepers that they used to be. I think with social media you can get, get your name out there and publicise yourself. I think what agents do, as I mentioned in the last uh, video, is they make kind of these neural networks between different people and they, they test their tolerance and if they're successful they then make that connection to another person and gradually this kind of web of expertise, genius and influence um, kind of un unfurls. So this idea that uh, the you having an agent is your blocker to being a media composer is an anathema. I think what's basically happening is the three pillars of the music industry are being broken down into a single amorphous mass. So the first kind of grand pillar was rock pop, you know, thousands of people adoring you, strobe lights, all of that kind of stuff. The secondary one, which was these kind of slightly more nerdy, less good looking chaps who were making uh, media music, film, TV, computer games. And thirdly, at the lowest rung of the ladder was library or production music. Now there were some interesting paradigm shifts that happened in our industry in the 1990s. The first, obviously, the advent of the MP3, uh, piracy uh, became an issue, uh, record sales really started to be affected. The other was the growth of these global brands, the Nikes of this world, who started creating these global ad campaigns whereby people like Moby or Massive Attack were receiving gargantuan synchronization fees. So the big buzzword, you know, in the in the dawn of the age of piracy and the MP3 was it's all about synchronization. So suddenly there was a real push from the music industry to get act onto adverts. And this is when these kind of interesting music agencies that weren't of the normal model were popping up certainly around Soho, London's kind of advertising mecca. And what these people did was kind of blur the line between synchronizing existing pieces of music and commissioning new pieces of music. And for a lot of people who worked for these agencies, who were commissioned by them to write music, there was this interesting disconnect between the client and themselves. Suddenly there was this agency who was kind of QAing their work and commissioning work like it was like, well, I'm basically buying a synchronization and it's a synchronization that's kind of bespoke for this application, which is a fundamentally different way of approaching things. Also what people found was suddenly instead of taking 10 or 15%, they were nudging it past 20, 25%. As they started testing the tolerance of composers uh, wanting to get onto these amazing global life-changing fees ads, um, they were suddenly realizing, well, we can take 50, 60, 70%. And then when this kind of whole migration of the music industry from selling records to trying to get synchronizations came over, it was like, well, they're 
used to dealing with margins like 12% off face value of records. So suddenly, you know, I was being quoted for ads. Okay, well, you know, you take a 10% um, cut of this fee. And I was like, sorry, no, you take a 10%. And there was like, no, you take a 10% cut of this fee. And it was like, well, what does this relate to? And you go, well, it kind of relates to this, these arbitrary splits created by the recording industry. So that was the second kind of change. And the third thing that happened is, is that people started realising that it wasn't just the synchronisation fees. They were suddenly receiving these PRS checks going, these dudes are earning an absolute fortune. And hang on a minute, this is all library music. This is just like billions of quids worth of royalties. What are we doing? So suddenly the idea of secondary usage became a really big buzzword, whereby, yes, you could write some music for that, but then you could also dump it on a library or a production catalogue and create more money out of that. So suddenly all of these very convoluted deals that were based on synchronisations, commissionings, library and production deals and publishing deals uh, suddenly came to the fore. And this leaves us in a very strange space at the moment. And there's all sorts of really weird deals going on that are based around secondary usage, are kind of tied in with synchronisation deals. You know, I'm seeing breakdowns of fees that are being paid supposedly to a head of department who is the composer, but that's kind of going to a music agency and there's admin fees and there's publishing admin and all of these different things that... I just think you have to express extreme caution. You know, have these people got you this gig? You know, would you not have it if you didn't agree to these terms? And at the tail end, if you're not going to get anything up front, do you really stand to gain from this? Is it going to play in, what, two cinemas? What's the publishing revenue going to be off that? Uh, is it going to go to festivals and, and win awards? You know, is your name going to get spread around or is, is your music agency going to large it as some kind of great puppeteer in a wonderful soundtrack? I think these are the real difficulties, particularly with sync-heavy soundtracks. Your scores tend to be completely ignored. So you've just got to look at it as, well, Am I building a relationship here, or is that relationship being built between the music agency or supervisor and the client? Um, am I getting a decent upfront fee, or is the music agency taking the mainstay of that? Do I retain my publishing, or am I giving it all away? And is that portion of the publishing that I am retaining, is that going to be worth anything to me? And I guess as a last resort, if none of those boxes are ticked, is it going to get you nominations and awards? Are they going to support you and promote you to get those awards? These are all questions you can ask. And if all of those boxes remained unticked, I'd walk away. And I think I know your next question is, well, what about, you know, if it's good for experience or my showreel, all of that kind of stuff? I, th I act genuinely think bollocks to that. Working with Cox, for Cox, on a piece of cock, is just a complete waste of time. It damages your confidence, it damages your self-esteem, and there are far better ways of being able to put something up onto YouTube or onto Vimeo where you can show your skills writing amazing music. Your best work is not gonna come out of you being exploited. If you can find me one example of someone who's gone, yeah, I was really exploited there and I felt really good about it, it was great for my career, I'll eat this. So I guess I may have appeared to have meandered off somewhat, but there is always this drive, I think, with creative people who are wide-eyed and willing to do so much for so little there's always a temptation to exploit and this is uh, this is no exception with certain agents all of the main players certainly from my experience in London are absolutely legit and they've all been going for some time I think these slightly more crooked outfits you know they, they're very successful for a short time but they tend to burn out very quickly so if a company's been going for 20 30 years you're probably onto a good bet but do I have any advice well I think you have to ask yourself do you really need an agent uh, are you at a point in your life where really what's stopping you from getting work is an agent be truthful with yourself someone a while ago asked me when I was in a band you know what's your ambition and I said oh I'm to get a record contract and he said well that's a bit of a weird ambition he goes well what do you want to do with that so you know just have a record contract and then you know record some records and he goes right and what do you want to do with those records I don't know sell them and he goes, do you not want to be an international recording uh, act, uh, touring the world and doing st stadium shows? Is that not the end goal? It's like, well, I guess so. And he goes, well, if that's the end goal, a record contract is just something you pick up along the way. So what I would say to you is be very wary of picking up these kind of exclusive, constrictive deals. You know, avoid 
exclusive publishing deals wherever you can. I know it can be really tempting when someone goes, you know, this kid's got a bit of promise and this kid wants about 10 grand's worth of equipment. I think when you do get a, an agent, it's all about building that relationship. I see so many people, wonderful composers, who have a right old complaint about the fact that their agent hasn't called for, you know, six weeks or six months. And it's like, well, call them. Tell them your thoughts and feelings, the directions you want to go in, your roadmap. It's so important that you're aligned together on this journey. And I think it's also safe to say that you'll have a honeymoon period at first, and then there will always be frustrations. Believe you me, they're frustrated that you're not answering your telephone, you're not getting back your kind of cue sheets to the relevant people, all of this kind of stuff. It's very much almost like a kind of spousal relationship that has its ups and downs. But as with any marriage, it's something you really need to work at. And for, for me personally, I just wouldn't be here had it not been for my very special relationship with my agent and everyone that's worked for her. I think the key here is about finding the right match. I see so many people going, yeah, I've got this new agent. Absolute cunt, but that's what you need. You want an agent who's an absolute cunt, who really fights your corner. Yeah, kind of, but they have to represent your brand too and, and the networks you work with them. They need to kind of represent a work ethos, an enthusiasm for what it is you do, not just about being about the dollar. If you're looking at agents, look at their roster, but look at it carefully. If their roster's got Nick Cave and Radio head and uh, I don't know talk talk on it, it's likely that they're not actually representing Radiohead and and Nick Cave and talk talk it's likely that maybe they've synchronized uh, one of these tracks or one of these campaigns I think then if you look at the uh, roster look to see if there are kind of like-minded composers Look to see that maybe you could fill a hole in the gap on their roster and make sure maybe that the roster's not too big. I think it's very easy to be kind of wowed by these amazing William Morris sized uh, rosters, but it means you'll be a very, very small little minnow flapping around in a huge Caledonian lock.